I'm known for interrupting people, even former governors, when I want to. Comes with the territory, so let me ask you this. One, remember the rules at the beginning? I really do have a dinghy in the back and I will put you in it. I will at least give you the pleasure of a drink. But when the governor is speaking, I expect, I demand, as I do with my listeners, your 100% attention. So if you are especially on the lower deck, please come forward, give the governor his due respect. And while Hillary Clinton failed to do a reset with the Soviet Union, I'm going to do a reset on the MS Mount Washington. A big round of applause for Governor Gary Johnson. Uh, I would not be here right now uh, running for President of the United States if, number one, I didn't think I could do a good job and, the, and that I have the resume to actually show that. Uh, I was elected governor for two terms in New Mexico and I made a difference. I made a difference in standing up uh, against government, against the notion that government spends money and makes a difference in our lives. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't make a difference in our lives. The difference it makes in our lives is it actually adds burden to our lives, it actually encumbrances our lives, and it ends up costing us a lot more money when it comes to government. So in New Mexico, I probably vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. I vetoed 750 bills while I was governor of New Mexico. I had thousands of line item vetoes as governor of New Mexico. Uh, only two were overridden. It made a huge difference when it came to spending. It made a huge difference when it came to government and what is government role in our role in our lives. New Mexico is a state that's two to one Democrat. I think it speaks volumes to the fact that I got re-elected the second time by a bigger margin in a state that was two to one Democrat. I just think it speaks volumes to the fact that people really appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars. So we are bankrupt in this country now. We are bankrupt. The biggest issue that's facing this country right now is the fact that we cannot repay $14 trillion in debt when our ongoing deficit is $1.65 trillion this year, last year, the year before, years going forward. Look, we're on the verge of a financial collapse and it's because of our deficit, it's because of our debt. We should eliminate the corporate income tax. By eliminating the corporate income tax, we will create tens of millions of jobs in this country, making this country the only place to start up, grow, and build a business. Eliminate the corporate income tax, balance the budget. Gary Johnson, as President of the United States in the year 2013, will submit a balanced budget to Congress. And that's what needs to happen. And that means that we need to cut 43 cents out of every single dollar that we're spending. And if we don't do that, we're going to all be left with nothing. And that starts off with a conversation about Medicaid and Medicare. I think the federal government could block grant the states a fixed amount of money and leave health care to the delivery of the states. 50 laboratories of innovation, 50 laboratories of best practices. And you know what? There would be best practices. There would be failure. The failure would get avoided. The best practices would get emulated. But the notion that Washington knows best, the Washing that Washington it, it one size fits all, it doesn't fit. It's stifling and it's got us to the point where we're not going to survive as a country unless we control this. Defense. It's, 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 we have to cut our defense budget. And we also have to provide for a strong national defense for ourselves. But that's the key ingredient here. We've gone so far beyond uh, defense. Uh, we've been nation building for decades. We're building roads, schools, bridges, highways, and hospitals in other countries, and we're borrowing 43 cents out of every, I say borrowing, borrowing and printing 43 cents out of every dollar that we're spending. This is not sustainable. We have those same needs here in this country today. Iraq, before we went into Iraq, I said, we don't need to do this. Number one, there's not a military threat. If there is weapons of mass destruction, if there are weapons of mass destruction, we could go in 
and we could deal with that situation militarily. We could, walk, we could see that through our surveillance capabilities. I thought if we went into Iraq, we'd find ourselves in a civil war to which there would be no end. Afghanistan, initially, I thought that was totally warranted. We were attacked, we attacked back, and after six months of being in Iraq, we had effectively eliminated Al-Qaeda. That was 10 years ago. We need to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan tomorrow. And for the debate and the discussion that we would have about doing that, about whether that was right or wrong, that would be a debate and a discussion that would be totally warranted, but that's a debate and a discussion that we'll have 25 years from now, if that's when we finally decide to get out. And Libya, I'm in, a, I'm in an environment right now where I have to issue an opinion on everything that's happening all the time, and I enjoy the arena. I enjoy my job being governor of New Mexico, or I wouldn't be here right now. But. I enjoy the fact that I get to issue an opinion, and when it comes to Libya, I'm opposed to Libya, A through Z. Where was the congressional authorization to go into Libya? Where in our Constitution does it say that because we don't like a foreign leader that we should go in and topple that foreign leader? The unintended consequence of government. We take out Saddam Hussein in Iraq and, and Iran raises its head. Its main consideration, its main foe is Iraq. We take out Iraq, now it may potentially be a threat to the United States. It's not, but we should remain vigilant to that. Libya, aren't there five other countries in the Middle East right now that qualify for the same intervention that we've that we've brought about in Libya? Haven't, aren't we in, our, in a civil war right now in Libya? There doesn't seem to be any end to this. Um, social security. Social security is, is a system that is when it comes to a problem is pale in comparison to Medicare. Medicare is going to ab absolutely engulf the entire federal budget here in a very short amount of time if it's not brought under control. But Social Security, to reform Social Security so that it's a system that takes in more money than what it pays out, and that's what the si system simply is, we can fix it without raising taxes. And that would be a combination of raising the retirement age, that would be a combination of means testing and I just throw out these as examples, there are others. The other would be to change the escalator built into Social Security from the wage index to the inflation rate. But if we don't address these problems now, uh, we're going to find ourselves with nothing, and I think that that's the point that we've gotten to in this country. I believe in free markets. I think there's a magic to free markets, and whenever government gets involved, there are unintended consequences to go along with government being involved. So government needs to stay out of, of business. As governor of New Mexico, I think business went to sleep at night when I was governor of New Mexico knowing there was a certainty. They didn't have to worry about legislation that was going to pass that wasn't going to make a difference in anyone's life other than to add burden or, or, or uh, make business harder to conduct in, bus in, uh, in New Mexico. That did not happen. So free markets. Free markets when it comes to uh, health care. Free markets when it comes to education. I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice, believing that the only way we're going to reform education in this country is to bring about competition to public education. In New Mexico, for six straight years, I proposed that every single student in New Mexico get a school voucher that would have brought about that reform to education. What could the federal government do beyond any other single action to improve education in this country, that would be to abolish the Federal Department of Education. Give, give education back to the states. 50 laboratories of innovation all out in this notion of best practices. There would be best practices. There would be failure. The failure would get avoided. The best practices would get emulated. In the case of New Mexico, I have to tell you, best practices would have been school vouchers. Bring competition to public education. I know that immigration really is a hot button issue, and I was a border state with the with the state uh, with the state of Mexico with with Mexico. 
First of all, I think that this is a country that is that is based on immigration, that immigration is a good thing. We're a country of immigrants. Because of our convoluted immigration policies right now, we're educating the best and brightest kids from all across the world, and because of our convoluted immigration policies, we're sending them back to their countries of origin, as opposed to letting them stay here to grow, nurture, develop those businesses that ultimately would have been American jobs, as opposed to right now, they may end up being Indian jobs. But when it comes to immigration, immigration should be about work, not welfare. We shouldn't be delivering one welfare dime to any immigrant that wants to come into the United States. And that should be a state's issue. But when it comes to wanting to come into the United States, let's make it as easy as possible for somebody who wants to come into the United States to get a work visa. And a work visa would not be citizenship, it would not be a green card, but it would be a work visa which would entail a background check and a social security card so that applicable taxes would get paid. For the 11 million illegal immigrants that are here in this country right now, we need to recognize the main reason why they are here illegally, and that's because of the government. The government has made it impossible to get a work permit, and yet they know that there are jobs that exist even if they cross illegally, so that's what they end up doing. When Ronald Reagan set up his amnesty period in the 80s, he coupled that with putting government in charge of quotas for those individuals that wanted to come into work and matching that up was with business. From day one, that was a breakdown, and that what has that's what has led to 11 million illegal immigrants. So with regard to the 11 million illegal immigrants, set up a grace period whereby they can get a legal work visa. Not citizenship, not a green card, but a work visa. That's how you secure the borders, as you determine who's over here illegally, and then make it a one strike you're out. If you're in this country working illegally, and we've made it easy to be here uh, and work uh, legally, then make it a one strike you're out. You get arrested, you get deported, and you won't come back in this country and work again. And as Republicans, as Republicans, we've got to stand up and do a cost-benefit analysis with regard to everything it is that we're seeing. You can't turn your back just because that's not an issue I want to look at. We need to look at the cost-benefit. So what's the cost-benefit of building a fence across 2,000 miles of border or putting the National Guard arm-in-arm -arm across 2,000 miles of border? I have to tell you, I think it would be a whole lot of money spent with very little, if any, benefit whatsoever. And then talking about immigration and border violence, and so much of what the problems are around the border is drug violence. Uh, I would advocate legalizing marijuana. Legalize marijuana. Control it, regulate it, and tax it. It'll never be legal to smoke pot, become impaired, get behind the wheel of a car like alcohol. It's never going to be legal for kids to smoke pot or buy pot. But it's arguably 75% of the border violence with Mexico is marijuana related. That is the drug cartels activities that are engaged in the trade of marijuana. If we can't connect the dots between 28,000 deaths south of the border over the last four years, and prohibition, I don't know if we ever will be able to. These are disputes that are being played out with guns rather than in the courts. I really thank you all for allowing me to be here this evening. I think we're going to get to take some questions, uh, comments, insults. I will tell you. I will yes, we will. We, not the insults. We, we, well, New, New, New Hampshire people are very respectful, I will say that, I, I would, based on my experience. But you're going to get hard questions, as you do for me, when uh, well, we, we agree on a lot of things and we go at each other on a lot of things. Why don't you hand that mic over to Alan? I'm going to turn this over now.